O oh, heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fullest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us. Cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O oh, good one. Amen. All right. So, so very good to see everybody. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's the text. There's the text. And we don't have, we've got a couple, just a couple pages left. So, ah. um, so we can get right to it or we could read very slowly as well. <laughs> yes. That's true. Okay, so who wants to read? I could start. Okay. The globalization, is that where we're starting? Yeah. Uh, the globalization has not only political and legal, but also economic and cultural informational dimensions. In economy, it is manifested in the emergence of transnational corporations, which have accumulated considerable material and financial resources and have employed an enormous number of people in various countries. Those standing at the head of international economic and financial structures have concentrated in their hands a great power beyond the control of nations and even governments and beyond any limit, be it a national border, an ethnic and cultural identity, or the need for ecological and demographical sustainability. Sometimes they refuse to reckon with the customs and religious traditions of the nations involved in the implementation of their plans. The church cannot but be concerned also for the practice of financial speculations, obliterating the dependence of income on the effort spent. Among various forms of this speculation are financial pyramids, the collapse of which causes large scale upheaval. In general, such changes in economy result in the loss of priority that labor and man have over capital and means of production. In the field of culture and information, the globalization has been conditioned by the development of technologies facilitating the movement of people and objects and the acquisition and distribution of information. Societies which were separated earlier by distances and borders and therefore predominantly homogeneous now come in touch e easily and become multicultural. This process, however, has been accompanied by attempts to establish the dominion of the rich elite over the rest of the people and of some cultures and worldviews over others, which is especially intolerable in the religious field. As a result, there is a tendency to present as the only possible a universal cultural devoid of any spirituality and based on the freedom of the fallen man, unrestricted in anything as the absolute value and measure stick of the truth. The globalization developing in this way is compared by many in Christendom to the construction of the Tower of Babel. While recognizing the globalization as inevitable and natural, and in many ways facilitating people's communication, dissemination of information, oh, of people's communication, dissemination of information and more effective production and enterprise the church points to the internal contradictions of these, of these processes and to their threats. Firstly, the globalization begins to change along with the conventional ways of organizing production, the conventional ways of or organizing society and exercising power. Secondly, many positive fruits of the globalization are available only to nations comprising a smaller part of humanity but having a similar economic and political system. Other nations to whom five sixths of the global population belong have found themselves on the margins of the world civilization. They have been caught in debt dependence on financiers in a few, in, in a few industrial countries and cannot create dignified living conditions for themselves. Discontent and dis disillusionment are growing among them. The church raises the question concerning the need to establish comprehensive control 
over transnational corporations and the process taking place in the financial sector of the economy. This control aimed to subject any entrepreneurial and financial activity to the interests of man and people should be exercised through all mechanisms available in society and state. The spiritual and cultural expansion fraught with total unification should be opposed through the joint efforts of the church, state structures, civil society, and international organizations for the sake of asserting in the world a truly equitable and mutually enriching cultural and informational exchange, exchange combined with efforts to protect the identity of nations and other human communities. One of the ways to do this, one of the ways to do it is to ensure for countries and nations an access to basic technological resources, which will enable, enable them to disseminate and receive information on the global scale. The church reminds that many national cultures have Christian roots. The followers of Christ, therefore, are called to promote the interconnectedness of the faith and the cultural heritage of nations, opposing resolutely any manifestations of anti-culture and commercialization of the space allocated to information and arts. Generally, the challenge of globalization demands that contemporary society should give an appropriate response based on concern for the peaceful and dignified life for all people and combined with efforts for their spiritual perfection. In addition, efforts should be made to achieve such a world order, which would be based on the principles of justice and the equality of people before God and exclude any suppression of their will by the centers of political, economic, and informational influence. Well, so, and this is a really, this is a really interesting hmm. section because the, the whole problem of globalization, and this was 20 years ago, written 20 hmm. years ago. Hmm. The whole problem of globalization is really, um, I think, really acute. And I think they hit the nail on the head when they talk about the elites taking over uh, control. Um, but there's, uh, you know, and, it, and the relativ relativization of the nation state, the relativization of national culture and, and local cultures and um, and with them, religious traditions. Um, and it, of course, it also is important, I think, to, to recognize that a lot of the, the whole globalization movement is atheist. Um, well, it's, it's, it's maybe more than that. It, you know, um, it, it's sort of like a new iteration We lost you. We like we leave. Yes, we've lost you. Lost you, Richard. You you mute. You got hmm. being American and American values. Um, Richard, we missed most of what you just said because. Oh, I'm sorry. Of the computer problem. Sorry. You yeah, I, I I don't think the I, I don't think the connection is very good. Sorry. Are you in Are you in North Carolina? No, no, I'm on my daughter's uh, Chromebook, but it's not, it's not as good as mine, I, but I, my, mine's out of commission. Uh-huh. So, sorry. So we missed most of that. Uh, that's okay. Well, I think, I think we've got a huge problem, and I don't think we have any, I don't, you know, and you've got things like the Vatican that are totally on board with it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the Russian Orthodox Church is totally on board with it. Certainly Istanbul is totally on board with it. Yeah. I thought the comparison to the Tower of Babel was very interesting. Yes. I can... Um, You know, well, ultimately, it's, you know, it's the religion of Antichrist. It's preparation for the Antichrist. A, a single 
a single system under, um, you know, under the control of a few who will, um, which eventually will, will be focused on um, the Antichrist as he uh, takes power in Israel. But, um, but, it, but what it is, it's, a, it's, another, it's another version of Chiliasm. Um, and Father Seraphim Rose writes extensively about, about that. And, he's, and I think he's dead on, quite frankly. Um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's this idea of being able to create some kind of an earthly paradise or an earthly kingdom um, that, will, uh, that is not in, not in relation to God, but, is, but, it, but becomes the substitute for, for God. It becomes a substitute for heaven. It becomes a substitute for religion. And it becomes a substitute for um, you know, national and family identities. It's interesting that, you know, here are all these super rich globalist elites who are, who are uh, pushing socialism and they have for a hundred years or more. It doesn't make sense to me because, because you would think that they would, you know, their assets would be the first to be confiscated, but uh, I think they, they think they have that under control, I guess. So would that be more like a, a means to getting people to sort of step into a situation of greater control that, you know, socialism would be a sort of, sort of stepping stone? Yeah, it's the national, you know, that's what, you know, it's interesting what fascism is. It's, it's control of, uh, con, uh, essentially it's control um, of the, uh, of a, country through the corporations. Hmm. A governing elite controls it through the corporations. That's, that was, so that's, for example, what uh, Nazi Germany was. Hmm. They didn't, you know, they didn't confiscate the private property, but, but they subverted all of the, um, uh, the lives of the people through the control by the corporations. Hmm. So, but it, but it's it's interesting, you know. Since this was written, there's been this upsurge um, in uh, nationalism. You know, certainly not only in the United States but in Europe as well, and uh, you know, which is in reaction against this the whole globalist vision. So. So I suppose the whole globalist thing is, in, is in essence, leftist. But, but I think here where it says, spiritual and cultural expansion fraught with total unification should be opposed to the joint efforts of the church states structures, civil society, and international, for the sake of asserting in the world a truly equitable and mutually enriching cultural and informational exchange combined with efforts to protect, protect the identity of nations and other human communities. You know, it's just, I mean, the idea of, of life without um, some other kind, you know, some other aspect of um, uh, identity aside from the state and aside from uh, production and, uh, con and consumption. Um, uh, that's, that's, of course, that's, that's right out of, it's right out of Marx. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, I can kind of go on about that. So, somebody want to read number four? <clears throat> Let's 
I'll go on. Uh, okay. The contemporary international legal system is based on the priority given to the interests of the earthly life of man and human communities over religious values, especially in those cases when the former and the latter come into conflict. This priority is sealed in the national legislation of many countries. It is often built in the principles regulating various activities of the governmental bodies, public educational system, etc. Many influential public mechanisms use the same principle in their open confrontation with faith and the church, aimed to oust them from public life. These manifestations create a general picture of the secular, secularization of public and social life. While respecting the worldview of non-religious people and their right to influence social processes, the church cannot favor a world order that puts in the center of everything the human personality darkened by sin. This is why, invariably open to cooperation with people of non-religious convictions, the church seeks to assert Christian values in the process of decision-making on the most important public issues, both on national and international levels. She strives for the recognition of the legality of religious worldview as a basis for socially significant action including those taken by state, and as an essential factor which should influence the development amendment of international law and the work of international organizations. The bases of the social concept of the Russian Orthodox Church are called to serve as a guide for the synodal institutions, dioceses, monasteries, parishes, and other canonical church institutions in their relations with various secular bodies and organizations and the non-church mass media. This document shall be used by the church authorities to make decisions on various issues relevant within particular states or a narrow period of time, as well as very particular subject matters. The document shall be included in the curriculum of the theological schools of Moscow Patriarchate. As changes take place in public and social life and new problems significant for the church emerge in this area, the bases of the church's social concept may be developed and improved. The results of this process shall be adopted by the Holy Synod, the local or bishop's council. Yes. Well, I think this, you know, this emphasize, this is really important, you know, that, um, you know, that we realize that the church realizes that, that this whole system of, of globalization, of internationalization of, of the legal system and of every, everything else has atheist secularism as, as its foundation and as its, as its ideal. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, I find, you know, extremely um, distressing is, is to see that how the, uh, um, for example, how uh, American policy, State Department policy um, forces um, all, of, all of our uh, client states uh, to adopt these great American values such as abortion, homosexuality, gay marriage, and, and other, other forms of immorality, that these are now identified as, as fundamental American values. And, um, you know, and it, but it, you know, and, and then because, because of the, you know, the, because of the, situation, political situation, you know, the United States forces these down the throats of all of these other, of all of these other countries as a criterion uh, for them to get aid from the uh, Imperial Center. So, I don't know. Um, and I don't know if the church is, is able or prepared to be able to fight against this.
I mean, it's a it's a huge huge problem. It does seem that when when in the Bible men were building the the Tower of Babel that God in his wisdom, you know, chose to mess things up as it were and and sort of make the nations make distinct nations. So mm -hmm. it sort of feels like we're coming to a point where that's been seriously undone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's undoing something that God in his wisdom decided was a good idea. It can't be good. Mm -hmm. So anybody else have any questions or comments? No, we're, I think we're starting to pick up where the Soviet Union left off. Yeah. They, they emerged because it was gradually, dramatically understood that what they were about didn't work. And we're picking up where they left off. God help us. Well, the com you know, the communists were, were known to be internationalists. And, you know, now instead of internationalists, we've got globalists. And I don't think those two ideas are very distinct from one another. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> Globalization simply implies the addition of space, which was not a reality in the time of the Soviet Union, yeah. as much as it is now. But to what extent do people, and to what extent even does the church fully understand what all this means? Um, I think the church probably has a pretty good idea. Yes, undoubtedly, Pratika, particularly individuals the in, yeah, the in high positions. <laughs> right, the leaders of the church. Right. So... But changes are going on on the basis of these ideas right here in our country, and no one is stopping it. Right. People are beginning to speak out against it, but no one is stopping it. So. Well, we just go along with it. Yep. do what one one of the either hierarchs or um abbots what one someone in russia suggested uh, was already talking about the way to live in this developing new situation is to uh find a community out of out of the center very much like the new monastery you have established Badika, uh, out of the line <laughs> of action and aden identify with one of these communities and live closely within the church, close to the church and within its community. It's, it's laid out pretty well in Seraph and Rose. That it is. Ah, <laughs> I have not read Religion yet, of the future, orthodoxy and the religion of the future. Oh, wow. So, so Richard, what's your take on all of this from, from your perspective, from your... 
Well, I have a friend, Rebecca Dillingham in North Carolina who's Orthodox and she has four children and they want to move to Russia, even though they don't speak Russian, they have no Russians uh -huh. in there. So I think the idea of a, a nation state that pr protects Christian communities is an attractive proposition. Yeah, it is. What's your take on the, uh, so anyway, so are we, uh, so now we're done, we're done with this document. If anybody else has any, any kind of questions or, or comments. Perhaps you could speak about the patriarch. I've always wanted to know more about Patriarch Kirill. Well, you know, I don't know lots of details. Um, I know him, you know, I've worked with him. Um, you know, I, I know him, you know, personally in that way. Um, uh, the Patriarch, you know, he, the Patriarch is very strong and has, he's very focused. He's, uh, he spent many years as the uh, external affairs officer, the, the same position that uh, Metropolitan Hilarion Elfeyev now is in. Um, but it's kind of interesting. He, um, uh, when he was in that office, um, he had, shall we say, a lot more um, independence um, that he arranged. It was almost like a parallel chancery. Um, so it was a kind of almost autonomous kind of thing. I don't know how well he and, and Patriarch uh, Alexei got along. They have, they have different styles. Um, uh, of course, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev uh, was a close disciple of Patriarch Kirill. Um, and uh, uh, as you know, and then now, and then of course succeeded him um, in his, in his office, but he's, um, uh, the patriarch has, has structured things so that uh, uh, the, 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 amount of, the, the amount of power that the Office of External Affairs has um, is still very much under the control of the patriarch and, and that it can't develop into a kind of, some kind of autonomous Mm, entity and that's it's some kind of it, it's interesting uh, um, it's kind of interesting that way but you know he I think he takes very seriously the uh, position that you know he is standing up for the full integrity of the Orthodox faith um, and that uh, that he's he is the one world leader of the Orthodox Church who's willing to, who's really willing to s step up and step out and, um, and make that, you know, and, and go against what's politically correct, to go against the American empire, to go against the, um, uh, the whole kind of um, immorality that is, that is gripped Western culture and, and to critique it. Um, he's got a very, he's got a very acute critique of uh, uh, Western culture. And the th part of the thing is he knows it because he's spent time here. He speaks fluent English. Um, and I don't know how many other languages. He's spent, he spent years with the World Council of Churches. He spent years hopping back and forth. He's, you know, He's got not only a very strong relationship with the Roman church, but also with the non-Chalcedonian churches, with the major uh, Protestant churches, you know, that, which, is, which was his job. Um, uh, of course, now he's focused more on um, internal policy in Russia. But, but the whole vision um, of President Putin and of... Uh, uh, the leadership in Russia is, is to re-Christianize the country and to replace Bolshevik ideology with Christianity, with Orthodoxy. Um, and of course, it's a long process and, you know, and, and bringing people to conversion and all of that is, 
it's a long, well, it's a long process. <laughs> um, uh, because the only, really the only way one can become orthodox and be orthodox is through repentance. Um, so. I don't know what else to, but so far, so far as his leadership goes, I mean, it's, it's very strong and, and, um, and so he, you know, and especially right now in relationship to the other Orthodox churches, um, he's standing up against Constantinople and Constantinople's, um, really, uh, unacceptable uh, actions. You know, the latest nonsense coming out of Istanbul is that um, they're gonna declare Metropolitan Anufri and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uncanonical. Mm. Of course, the Russian Orthodox Church will uh, essentially will pro proclaim Constantinople and those with them uncanonical. Um, and eventually, uh, what it's going to lead to, if, if nothing stops it, is that um, Bartholomew is going to be anathematized, which is pretty serious, to say the least. Um, and that means that the schism is hard and fast. That means that, you know, there can be no communion, no communion going, of people going back and forth with the Greek churches or any of the other churches that uh, uh, are subject, uh, subject to Istanbul or in communion with Istanbul. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's, that's very serious. Um, you know, I think I personally, I think Patriarch Kirill is right on, absolutely right on. And I totally support you know, what he's doing. So. But none of the other, none, well, it also helps that he, he represents over a hundred million people, <laughs> you know? Um, and so has that, um, that gives him, um, a, a depth of authority that is way beyond anything anyone else has. So. so what do you, what, what else? Nobody has anything else? Thinking about your Christmas list or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you do have the question of when it's justified for the church to interfere uh, and object to government policy. Well, you know, I think, personally, I think that... Um, uh, the church needs to be the conscience of the state. And especially, I mean, in Russia, that's essentially what you, what we see in this document. Um, uh, but, and you can do that when you've got a fairly homogenous population that with a, with a single, with mainly one major, one main church. You see the ultimate fail of that in the with the angle with Anglicanism. It's not the conscience of anything. <laughs> um, and so less than what two or three percent of the population actually go. It's 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 tragic. But that's but that but the result of, that's the result of, of complete and absolute and complete surrender uh, to the culture. And that's, you know, and that's where American Protestantism is going. You know, absolute and complete surrender to the culture, secularization, and um, primacy of 
either non or anti-Christian values. Um, and, the fe- and the fear of, being, of standing up to the uh, society and saying no. So. Ladika, to what extent do you think the uh, re, so-called re-Christianization of Russia actually has taken place? Oh, I think it's, it's still just beginning. It's going to take generations. Mm. And hopefully, you know, they'll have the same kind of continuity of uh, um, worldview that, uh, that there is now. If not, uh, who, it's all up for grabs. You know, because on one hand, you've got the West, you know, pushing and pushing, um, you know, for uh, total influence. Um, and then you've got, uh, then you've got uh, the more the Christian ele- Orthodox elements in society reacting against that. So. There does seem to be, though, a great, at least among people I know who are not Orthodox in Russia, uh, who are good friends, uh, they have a great deal of respect for the church. Mm-hmm. I don't know how widespread that is among people who are not Orthodox. And these are people who have just grown up in, in the Soviet culture and just have never become Orthodox, but they have a great deal of respect for it. Well, to a great extent, you know, I, I think 80% of the population is baptized Orthodox in Russia. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're faithful. They don't even know necessarily what that means. Yeah. And so that's, that, that's part of the problem. I think part of the problem uh, may be that the uh, Russian Orthodox Church doesn't proselytize very much, uh, especially compared to the Mormons. Is, is there any movement uh, to increase uh, such a uh, pro- policy? Well, yeah, there's, there's actually a huge amount of uh, missionary outreach going on uh, in Russia. Um, there's all sorts of various, uh, every parish has, uh, is, is developing schools and outreach programs to the youth and it, uh, to the military, to all these various segments of society. Um, uh, there are two Orthodox TV stations. Um, you know, the, uh, there's, a, there's a very strong push um, for uh, Christian values. There's, uh, there's a, uh, the anti-abortion is, is an extremely strong movement now in Russia. Um, it used to be that the average woman would have between seven to, seven to 10 abortions uh, in her lifetime. Um, and now that's, that's been way reduced. Um, it used to be that under the Soviets that uh, women would have one or, two, one or two children, now they're having more. Uh, and, and large families are reappearing, which is a, which is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, you know, there are you know, laws, laws against gay propaganda, um, which, is, which, is, which is excellent, I think. Um, you know, and, you know, but generally the, I think the idea is, is, is to get people thinking in terms more, more in terms of Christianity. Um, uh, and, and at least if people respect it, it's better than if they hate it. You know, it's not public enemy number one anymore. When Putin uh, described himself as being orthodox and going to the cathedral, uh, was there a, a ups, 
uptick of membership um, uh, of people going to church more? I don't know. I felt that the leader was was uh, orthodox, so that it's safe to go. Well, I think Putin, you know, was was he was part of a movement. You know, there were many. I he. I don't. I don't know how much his his personal commitment to the to the church is uh, seen as a as a model uh, by by other people. It's, my guess is it probably is. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and, and he does go to, uh, you know, he, he is a faithful Christian. He does go to confession and communion. So. Well, some people felt it's a political move on his part. Well, all, people think all sorts of things. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so <clears throat> I happen, happen to know two of his confessors. <laughs> so uh, he's for real. So. Well, so if anybody has anything else, otherwise we can we can call it a night early. Oh, uh. <laughs> I'm driving to the monastery in West Virginia tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be there for until Monday night. So I'm looking forward to that very much. How big is it? They have about 35 monks. Oh, that's a good size. Yeah. Yeah, it's it really is, and it's a very good, strong, healthy community. Lindick, I'd like to send you a copy of a letter that went to the abbot. If I could get your email, sure. You, ha I think you have my email. I'm pretty sure you do. I've got yours somewhere. Uh, let's see. Yeah. RTH Consulting? Yes, RTH Consulting at live.com. Uh huh. If you'd send me your email, mm -hmm. I'll send you a copy of a letter that went to the Abbot there recently. Very good. I just sent it, I just sent it off. Thank you. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I think let's uh, let's wrap it up for tonight. So let's let's pray. It is truly me to bless the Atheotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, without corruption that gave his birth to God the Word. True Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, into ages of ages. Amen. 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 So I wish everybody a happy Santa Claus Day. <laughs> happy St. Herman, St. Spirit on Day. Yeah, it's my birthday. Ah, oh. well, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. And Merry Christmas. Um, and uh, first Christmas. And so, uh, let's see. On... Uh, January twelfth, we're looking at uh, we're looking at uh, having a or no tenth uh, was it tenth yeah um, dinner here barbecue something um, uh, in the uh, on the afternoon Sunday afternoon so it'd be great to have everybody up here or down here we're not that far. <laughs> it's really, when when there's not much traffic there's, it's only a little over an hour that's right that's so, right when there's lots of traffic it's awful <laughs> <laughs> I just have an email Vladika about that to the group is is it is two o'clock a good time to meet or do you want to yeah I think I think two o'clock is is good you know have a kind of 
Um, well, actually, let's see. Uh, to, uh, sometimes I often don't get away from the um, from the parish right. until three. Right. Right. And then it takes forty five minutes to get home. Well, um, so should we make it four? Yeah, probably four. If that is is that all right? Is that doable? Sure. Well, sure. Might, might try to make it. Okay. And, you know, maybe some of you can uh, uh, carpool from, you know, yeah. from, from up from up there. Yeah. And uh, that that'd be nice. And then you know, uh, bring stuff. Bring stuff to share. <laughs>